So Genesis 35, you can find that on page 30. We'll start at verse 1. God said to Jacob, Get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his family and all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in the day of my distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. Then they gave Jacob their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak tree near Shechem. When they set out, a terror from God came over all the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called that place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, the one who had nursed and raised Rebekah, died and was buried under the oak south of Bethel. So Jacob named it Alon Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You will no longer be named Jacob, but you will be named Israel. So he named him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, will come from you, and kings will descend from you. I'll give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac. I'll give the land to your future descendants. Then God withdrew from him at that place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set up a a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Then they set out from Bethel. They were still some distance from Epaphrath. Rachel began to give birth, and her labor was difficult. During her difficult labor, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. With her last breath, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Epaphrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker on her grave. It is the marker at Rachel's grave still today. Israel set out again and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. Israel heard about it. Jacob had 12 sons. Leah's sons were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Rachel's sons were Joseph and Benjamin. The son of Rachel's slaves, Bilhah, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's slave, Zilpah, were Gad and Asher. These are the sons who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac and Mamre in Kitith Araba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. His sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. This is the word of the Lord. A fascinating chapter as we come to the close of Jacob's story. Jacob's still around, but he'll now take a back seat His sons will take over the starring roles in the coming chapters. The next thing we'll hear about Jacob is when he dies later on in chapter 40 or 49, somewhere around there. But as we've been going through the story of Jacob, have you noticed the similarities between Jacob, his family, and the church? Hopefully there's a little bit less murder and deception going on in the church than there was in Jacob's family, but still... The similarities remain when you look at it on a whole. And that's because of a phrase that we've used a few times in the service already. Both the church and Jacob are the people of God. And throughout history, the people of God share many similarities and don't actually change all that much. 
So here, at the end of Jacob's story, we get a chance to reflect on what it actually means to be the people of God. What does that phrase mean? What does it look like? How does it apply to the church? Well, Genesis 35 gives us a number of those answers. And so after the horrible events of last week, surely we're left with a question. What happens to Jacob and his family now? Surely God's had enough. Surely they've done too much wrong and he's just going to wash his hands of them. But that's not the first thing we see. The first word we hear from God is not a word of condemnation, not a word of judgment or punishment, but have a look with me at verse 1. Get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar to the God who appeared to you when you fled for your brother Esau. I think it's appropriate that we stop and take a moment to reflect on just how amazing verse 1 is. After everything that has happened in the last chapter, God still calls Jacob, is still determined to fulfill his promise to bring him back to Bethel. God still has not forsaken Jacob. He has not left him. If I was God, I just would have let the other tribes attack him and be done with him, start again with someone new. But God is remaining faithful, not just to his promise to Jacob, but his promise to Isaac and Abraham before him. God will continue to build his people, no matter how hard they try to reject him. And so Jacob, seeing that God has fulfilled his part of the bargain, says, okay, we're going to take the worship of God seriously now. He tells his family and his entourage, it's time to put away all the other idols that you've got. And he buries them under a tree so they won't be tempted to go back to them. And this is the first thing that we see about what it means to be the people of God. It means to worship God and worship him only. Far too often we try and bring all our own little idols into church, but God's having none of that. To worship God means to worship him exclusively. And to worship God means to do so in the way that he wants to be worshipped. God didn't want Jacob to build an altar where he was. Jacob was quite happy staying where he was. He could have built an altar there. But God tells him to go back to Bethel, to build the altar at Bethel. God's not happy with worship just any old way. He only wants to be worshipped in the way that he has commanded us. For Jacob, that meant going back to Bethel. For us, that means coming to God through his word and by his son through whom he has revealed to us exactly who he he is and how he wants to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped through faith in his son, (coughs) revealed in his word. And this means we need to stop trying to look for God where he's not going to be found. You're not going to find God in your workplace, in your family, in nature. You'll only find God in his son and through his word. And this means we can't think that we'll keep finding God if we refuse to read his word or gather with his people. God's not going to be found there. In his son, God calls us to gather as his people in the church, calls us to read his word, to meet him there. That's where we get to meet God. Just like Jacob had to go to Bethel, we go to Jesus. We go to God's word and we gather with his people. Because that is where God wants to be found. Where are you looking for God? Are you looking for God where he's waiting to be found or are you trying to find him elsewhere? What idols are you holding on to? Have you given them up yet? Or do you think that God will share the throne with sport, family, work, money, But just like Jacob, it's time to bury the idols, meet God where he wants to be found, because when we do, something amazing happens. Because when Jacob gets to Bethel, God's still not done with him. 
God proves his faithfulness again by reinstating the blessing that he gave him the first time. And not just reinstating it, but making it bigger. No longer will Jacob just be a nation. He'll be an assembly of nations. Kings will come from Jacob's line. God looks at Jacob and everything that's happened, looks at his family and says, you're still my people. I will still bless you. And then, in a remarkable turn of events, God reinstates the command that he originally gave to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Why does God tell them to be fruitful and multiply? Well, just like he told Adam and Eve to fill the earth and subdue it, God's now looking at the start of his people and saying, multiply, make more of God's people. Make sure the people of God spread throughout the earth. God is not interested in a static people who stay in one place, who all look the same. God wants his people to grow, to spread. And from this one man, his two wives and 12 kids, comes a people of God who will eventually spread across to every country of the world to have his word spoken in every language that we currently know of. This is what God wants for his people to grow, multiply, spread. But then, after the great elation of meeting God again at Bethel, hearing the great promises restated, tragedy strikes the family again. Rachel dies giving birth to her second son. Deborah, her grandmother, also passes away. And towards the end of the chapter... So does Isaac, Jacob's dad, who he hadn't seen for so long. And this is a good reminder that God doesn't remove suffering from his people. Just because we are the people of God doesn't mean that we are promised a good life of ease and comfort. God so often walks with us and grows us through those times of suffering. The death of Rachel... The death of Deborah had nothing to do with Jacob's sins. They are just part of the suffering and hardship that is life this side of the new creation. And God doesn't shield Jacob and his family from that. But he will walk with him every step of the way, just like he has before, comforting him, guiding him, and shaping him to become Israel. And that's why how he works with us. He doesn't remove us from our suffering, but works with us through it, keeps us safe, grows us in our faith and love and knowledge of him so that when he brings us safely to the other side, we can say, look at how amazing God is. Look at how he worked through times that was tough, that were so hard. We are no less the people of God when we suffer than when we are in comfort. God has not abandoned us when we face hard times. He hasn't rejected us as his people. He's still there, working with us, so that he can help us to become even more the people of God than we ever thought possible. And then, one day, when King Jesus comes to reclaim his rightful rulership over the world, There will be a day with no more suffering, no more pain. We will get there. God has promised it. But until then, God has promised to work with us and protect us even when we suffer so that we might glorify his name together for all the amazing things that he has done. Now the death of Rachel is a tragedy in and of itself. But there's another problem. It's left a power vacuum in the politics of the family. Jacob's favourite wife has died. Suddenly, Leah's kids are getting a bit worried that they're about to be usurped by Joseph or the now-born Benjamin. So Reuben decides to take matters into his own hands. He decides to take family power by force. This is why he sleeps with Bilhah. 
The thing is, if you slept with your father's wives, claimed them as your own, you were saying, I run this family now. And that's exactly what Reuben is trying to do, cement his place as the firstborn. But this doesn't go according to plan. Jacob hears about it. And then on his deathbed in Genesis 49, Jacob's handing out blessings to all his kids. When he comes to Reuben, he gives not a blessing, but a curse. He says, Reuben, you will no longer excel at what you are trying to do because you slept with your father's wife. By trying to grasp at power and take it by force, Reuben ultimately lost it. And that's because power in the kingdom of God is not held by those who take it by force, by those who have influence or wealth. It's held by those who serve, held by the people who are humble, who commit themselves to working for the good of other people instead of raising themselves up. Reuben found this out the hard way. And this is how God has worked throughout history. Abraham was a nobody until God called him. Jacob was the youngest son who liked to stay in the tent cooking meals with his mum. But God still chose him. Reuben, Simeon and Levi were all disqualified from leadership in their family. And it's left with Judah, a nobody a middle son amongst 12. Even David wasn't even considered worthy enough to be called in from looking after the sheep when Samuel came came around looking for the next king. But he became the greatest king Israel had ever known. And then there's Jesus, born in a stable, so hated by the authorities that he was put to death on a Roman cross, an execution so horrific it was reserved for the worst of criminals. But in that act, Jesus cemented his place as the forever king of God's people because it was in that death that he allowed all of God's people to come back to God, not because of anything they had done to deserve it, but because of God's grace and mercy. How does your leadership look like? Do you spend your time grasping at leadership, desperately trying to grab more and more power? Do you try and force your leadership on other people? Or do you follow the example of the leaders of God's people throughout the story of the Bible? Humble those who are willing to serve others, no matter the cost. Because God works through the powerless, so that we don't get big heads and big egos, but so we say, look at what God has done, instead of look at what I have done. And then we get to the last words in this chapter. 23 to 26, they round out the chapter nicely with a summary of Jacob's kids, reminding us where we've come from. And I think this part of the story is a bit like the end of a wedding. I've only had the opportunity to to do one wedding while I've been here. I've been to a couple, but I always really like the bit right at the end of the service before the new couple walk back down the aisle to go to the car and get their photos because the minister gets to introduce the new family to everyone who's gathered. He'll get to say, I present to you the new Mr. and Mrs. What's-a-name? Smith, Fred, whoever. And then everybody applauds and the couple walks back down the aisle and gets to shake hands with everyone and greet them as a new family unit. Well, this is exactly what the author of Genesis is doing here. He's saying, I present to you the people of God. Jacob, Judah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, etc., etc. Liars, murderers, adulterers, every single one of them. But the people of God nonetheless, because of God's grace 
not because they've earned it, not because they deserve it, and certainly not because of anything they have done, but simply because God is kind and merciful to those who don't deserve it. And this is where our reading from the book of Ephesians comes in. Because I'm sure you can see the parallels to the church. Because this is how Paul describes the church. In verse 3 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says, We too all lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. We were by nature children under wrath. But thankfully, Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to verse 5 where he says, But God made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in our sins, you are saved by grace. The same thing could apply to us. Because of what Jesus has done for us, he can now walk up to God the Father and say, I present to you the people of God right here. Murderers. Thieves, liars, adulterers, every single one of them. But the people of God nonetheless, saved by faith in Christ purely because of the grace and mercy of Christ. So that we can come together as God's people and praise him for the amazing things that he has done for us. Even though we don't like to admit it, We are just as bad as Jacob's family. We are just as dysfunctional. But just like them, we have been saved by a gracious and merciful God who now calls us his people so that we can spread, grow, multiply and praise him for the works that he has done for us, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but because he is loving. So do people realize that you're a part of the people of God? Do people see it when they look at you? When they look at you, do they see you holding on to that family idols? Or do they see that you've gotten rid of them and worship God alone? Or do you look like them, worshiping sport, money, family, power? When they look at your family, do they see the grace and forgiveness that God has shown you? Or do they see pettiness and spite? Do they see you using your leadership in a manner that serves other people? Or do you look like the world, grasping at power at all costs? This is what it means to look like the people of God. To put away our idols to be cared for through suffering, to be saved by grace, to lead through service and to worship God alone. Just as God called Jacob, so he calls the church. Who are the people of God? Anyone who has faith, no matter their past, called by God to live for him, to put away their idols, called through suffering, led by the servant king until he brings us into the new creation where we get to live with him forever. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you for the example of Jacob and his family and pray that you will continue to work in us no matter what happens. Amen. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Why do they give the rings to Jacob when he only asks for their gods? Sorry. Why does he give? Why do they give their rings and earrings? Uh, probably because the rings and earrings were talismans and good luck charms and the like, and they no longer need those because they are walking under under the protection of God.